Good afternoon, everybody, and a particular welcome to uh, Professor Kathleen Bernard, who is Professor of EU Law and Employment Law uh, in uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, my name is Thahi O'Kelly. Uh, I'm the chair of the UK group uh, in the Institute, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this session today. Uh, before I introduce uh, Professor Barnard, I just want to remind you that she'll speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then uh, you, if you have questions, you can use the, the Zoom platform to ask the questions. And we have a question and answer, which will go on until about 2.30. Uh, uh, and just a quick reminder that today's uh, presentation and Q&A are both uh, on, on the record. Um, I think we've all known how important uh, an issue of migration has become. Uh, it's become, in some places, uh, politically very divisive, uh, as societies, particularly poorer societies, uh, try to absorb large numbers of migrants. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Bernard has made a special study of my, the, my, the, the, the result of migration in Great Yarmouth, in Norfolk, in, in the UK, uh, where large numbers of relatively poor migrants have arrived, mostly from Eastern Europe, over the last 20 years or so, and have landed in a society which itself was declining rapidly. Uh, Great Yarmouth had been an important fishing port, it had been an important uh, place for holidays and so on, uh, but from the Second World War onwards it has declined, and uh, it was an area which had very large numbers of people who voted for Brexit. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Professor Bernard uh, talk about migration in that area and about the effects which it has on both the migrants and on the population. Uh, Professor Bernard, I give you the floor. Thank you very much indeed. It's a, a great honour and privilege to be here with you today. Um, if I, um, the, your um, assistant very kindly going to do the slides, which are just coming up. And so you're absolutely right. I'm talking about Great Yarmouth, which I imagine quite a lot of people in this audience have never heard of, let alone been to. Next slide, please. But this is Great Yarmouth on a good day. Lovely big sandy beach, traditional seaside resorts, and quite a lot of British people have got some memories of riding donkeys along the seaside resort. And indeed, next slide, please. Banksy came to Great Yarmouth a couple of summers ago to do what's called his spraycation. And he produced this beautiful um, work of art uh, on the side of one of the rather nondescript buildings in the suburbs of Great Yarmouth. But it gives me huge amounts of pleasure each time I look at it. Next slide, please. You can also see the residue of the great days of Great Yarmouth. Um, through some of these old buildings, which were once concert halls, now they've become crazy golf. Next slide, please. Or they've become um, uh, venues for slot machines um, and other things. Now they're on the seafront. Can you press next, please? In fact, just behind the seafront, you, what you see is a significantly declining town. Um, with very poor infrastructure. Next slide, please. And as you can see, declining buildings. These buildings were once great buildings, beautiful Victorian buildings. If, if they'd been in London, they'd be selling for millions. But of course, they're not because they're in a pretty poor state. Now, as the chair helpfully pointed out, um, this town, which was already a town in significant decline, um, actually has welcomed a very large population of uh, low-skilled, low-paid EU migrant workers. Probably about one in four in the town centre are EU migrant workers, primarily from uh, uh, Latvia, um, Lithuania, uh, and more recently, Romania and Bulgaria, particularly um, Roma Romanians and Roma Bulgarians. And they've gone to work in big chicken factories. Bernard Matthews, for those of you who ever grew up in the UK, you might remember the, the beautiful advert that Bernard Matthews used to run to encourage people to buy Bernard Matthews turkeys. 
Next slide. And if they're not in the um, turkey industry, they're working in the fields in and around Norfolk. Um, uh, this one's uh, Sharrington Farm um, up on the North Norfolk coast. Next slide, please. I give you this by way of background just to tell you a little bit about the project that we have been doing for the best part of the last five years. So for those of you who want to do your geography, Great Yarmouth is almost the most easterly point in the United Kingdom. It's remote, it's pretty inaccessible. The nearest motorway is said to be in Amsterdam, not in anywhere else in the United Kingdom. But what we've been doing is to look at the problems faced by EU migrant workers in Great Yarmouth, um, the problems they've been experiencing at work, uh, in their housing, and also in, more generally in their general interaction with the local community. We've been working with a charity called Gyros, um, which is a rather impressive charity, which um, has been helping EU migrant workers with their day-to-day -day problems. And in particular, the need that um, they had to apply for EU settled status. That's the right to continue living in the UK post-Brexit. Every single EU national, except the Irish, um, needed to apply for settled status or pre-settled status. And that was a precondition for them to be allowed to work. Next slide, please. And what happens is, and next slide, they come on, they come to Jairos, um, they get advice from Jairos advisors who have come on the same migration journey as they have, so working in chicken factories. And unusually they give advice um, in the native language of those who are seeking advice from them. And just to give you a flavor, next slide please, of the clients um, that come to Gyros, what you can see, you can see the range of nationalities. You can also see just what low levels of English they've got, even if they've been in the UK for a long time. 70% uh, of the clients uh, rate their English as limited or very limited. Now that's not to say they're not multilingual. Often they speak three or four languages because they speak the language of the production line. Uh, and they learn very quickly, uh, even difficult languages like Polish, if the line manager is Polish. But their English is very poor, which means they really struggle to interact with um, the sort of basics of British society, interacting with the utility companies, TV licensing, uh, council tax. They also struggle to do anything online. And if you look at the numbers, um, that how, how poor their IT skills are. So 85% um, reckon uh, say that their IT skills are three out of 10 at best. And this was a real problem when they applied for settled status because the settled status scheme was dependent on absolutely everyone having one of these, you know, a nice big trendy iPhone, which of course is very expensive. It was a scheme developed in London by young folk who assumed that everyone was like them, spoke excellent English and had good IT skills which as you can just see from this graph is absolutely not the case. Next slide, please. The majority nationality um, is Lithuania uh, and indeed Portugal. Portugal is one of the largest diaspora community, Portuguese communities outside Portugal is in fact in Norfolk. They've been in the UK quite a long time, but as you can also see um, Romanian as well, Polish, um, and then you'll notice Guinea-Bissau. So what's also interesting in terms of um, the interactions with the local community is that there is a large non-white population that arrived who had Portuguese passports um, and came to the UK as Portuguese nationals, even though often they'd never actually lived in Portugal. Next slide, please. Now the work we did um, meant um, we did a lot of work with Gyros, but my excellent research assistant lived in the ill-named Buckingham House. Um, now, that picture makes it look like some beautiful um, Edwardian villa. And on the outside, it was fine. But on the inside, next slide, please. It was anything but fine. This is their, uh, the, the communal area, the communal kitchen. Next slide. It was meant, it was, part of it was absolutely a danger to live in. And yet the people who lived in that um, house 
thought it was a sanctuary because the landlord, although it must be said was a racist, he was absolutely opposed to anyone who was not white. He was very keen on having Eastern Europeans living in his house. Now this house is just off the street called um, St. Peter's Road. And what you can see here on the left-hand side, you can see the local brothel, um, uh, Sunset Studios. I think that was probably an overstatement of what goes on inside. And there are a large number of supermarkets on St. Peter's Road, um, most of which are selling knockoff cigarettes, which is how they make their money. Next slide, please. I've told you a little bit about Great Yarmouth and um, uh, the profile of the EU migrant workers living there. And as I've said to you, um, we've been looking at their experiences both at work uh, in terms of their accommodation and in terms of their access to healthcare. Now today, because my time is short, I'm going to focus on just one aspect of that, which is their experiences at work. And in summary, the answer is pretty terrible. Next slide. This is a picture from a focus group we did of um, uh, people who've been working in chicken factories and they all put their hands forward, say their hands really suffered because working in the cold meant their hands suffered, were swollen, were raw and red. And that's one of the constant themes that came out of it. Just the very poor working conditions in a chicken factory, which for obvious reasons have got to be cold. Next slide, please. Another com constant theme we heard repeatedly is the lack of training. People were literally dumped on a job and just told, you get on, to, on with it. Now, as you can see from this quote, I won't read it through, but uh, this was pretty typical of what people experienced. They were not told how to do the job. They weren't given any of the health and safety protection you would expect. And they're constantly told, it keeps coming out in our data, work faster, work faster. And some of them say that faster was the first English language word they ever, um, ever learned. The other issue, next slide please, was over toilet breaks. Um, they were regularly refused toilet breaks and partly you can understand it because they were wearing PPE um, and of course it would take time to take the, to the PPE off and put it back on. Um, but nevertheless, it was a constant complaint that they were not allowed to go to the loo. And if they did go to the loo, um, that was it. And they were told they'd be sacked um, if they actually did that. Next slide, please. They had really long working days. Uh, a bus would come, this is the bus, and pick them up and take them out to the chicken factories. And they would do often 12 hours on the, on the line. And then it would be an hour and a half each way um, with the um, bus to take them to and fro. And the, the other um, thing we heard repeatedly was just um, how tired people were. And for that reason, when they were at home, all they wanted to do was just slump in front of the television. And therefore the idea that they should do sort of <clears throat> virtuous interaction with the local community was absolutely for the birds. Next slide, please. Now, what's really interesting to us is the dissonance between what we were told about uh, in the focus groups and, in fact, what they came to Gyros for help about. And as you can see um, from this um, graph, a lot of them came to Gyros for help with support to engage with their employer, often for translating contracts or translating um, health and safety guidance. Um, you also see some very practical things like not being given pay slips or not being paid a salary. What you do not see there is the issue that came out a lot in the focus groups, which was um, how they suffered from racial and sexual harassment in the workplace. So there was a dissonance between what they actually came to complain about and what they actually reported to us what was going on. Next slide, please. So what we saw um, uh, in the Jaros data was that they people weren't being paid um, the right amount of money. They weren't being paid their, sal their either their salary or indeed holiday pay. It's a common practice 
for employers not to pay the right amount of holiday pay because that was often the profit margin on a on a job. Um, not being given pay slips, um, and uh, because they weren't given pay slips, that created problems down the line because it meant that when they were applying for EUSS, that's the post-Brexit status, they couldn't show how long they had actually been in the UK for and that affected whether they got um, settled status, the higher level, or only pre-settled status, the lower level. Lots came, as you saw, for support for just dealing with the employers about uh, English language issues, so translation issues. Next slide, please. As I said to you, um, there is this constant issue about non-payment of holiday pay. Um, here, uh, this is not, uh, to give you some sort of context, here we go. Uh, client worked for a particular company, left three months ago, he got his P45, the, the piece of paper you need when you leave your work, but he didn't get any of his holiday pay. And that's about 400 quid, which, of course, when you are poor, 400 quid is really quite a significant sum of money. When you're rich, 400 quid is a significant sum of money. And what's interesting is what do you do about it? So in this case, um, the Jaros worker contacted the head office um, and repeatedly contacted the company until eventually they did, in fact, pay up. Um, next uh, slide, please. The other issue that we see in the data is that um, a lot of these people are employed on zero hours contracts and zero hours contracts mean that they are very dependent on the line manager to actually offer them work. And so what you see is the, the migrant workers reporting, they basically have to bribe the line manager in order to make sure they get the hours so that they can earn enough to live on. And so as you can see in this case, um, the line manager took 20 quid from them um, and it was worth their while because they had the opportunity of earning uh, 200 quid by getting um, the hours they wanted. Next slide, please. Now, all of these problems, none in and of themselves catastrophic, but nevertheless grim, um, lead to what's called problem clustering. And this is not rocket science, but as you can imagine, if you um, are um, not being employed on a zero hours contract, so there's no work for you, that clearly um, affects your ability to um, pay for your rent. Um, it will take some time to claim welfare benefits, so you get into debt, and therefore life um, spirals downwards. And while I can elaborate on this elsewhere, I think it takes little imagination to see why people get into such trouble very quickly when they're on um, low paid work and certainly with no savings. And so this comes to the question that um, I want to think about, which is what happens when enforcement doesn't happen. Next slide, please. So to summarize what I've been saying, um, these are the, the most common problems that we've seen um, in the JAROS database. People on zero hours contracts getting very little pay, not getting toilet breaks um, and other issues, which has long term impacts on their health. Now, just for your information, the drawings on the left are drawings by one of the JAROS workers um, who drew from her own memory what she was experiencing when she was not working for gyros but was working in chicken factories now we we originally tried to put some um a request into ai to see if they could draw come up with some pictures of chicken factories and the pictures came back of chickens running around like mad things on the chicken on the factory floor which of course is not the case because they're working for, throughout with dead chickens and these are said dead chickens next slide please now, you might be thinking, well, look, you know, this is pretty bad and presumably UK employment law covers all of this stuff. And so why is it that um, this is not being dealt with? Well, next slide, please. Under EU law, as you know, Article 7.1 of what's now the Workers' Regulation 49211, says uh, a migrant worker must not be treated any differently from national workers in respect of conditions of employment, um, as regards remuneration, dismissal, um, reinstatement or re-employment. So this requires equal treatment. And it's 
to be fair to the UK, there is absolutely equal treatment. All of these rights will apply equally to EU nationals as they do to UK nationals. So at the formal level, there's absolutely no doubt there is equal treatment. Next slide, please. Furthermore, in the EU enforcement directive, it's quite clear that member states have got to ensure judicial procedures for the enforcement of obligations under Article 45, that's the provision on free movement of workers, and under the workers' regulations, and they've got to be available to all union workers and members of their family. And this is also the case, the UK it does indeed um, allow for EU migrant workers to enforce their rights before employment tribunals, that's the um, base level tribunal um, which uh, migrant workers can go to and UK workers can go to. And indeed, some migrant workers do actually get to employment tribunals. Next slide, please. And again, and again, and one more time. Now, <clears throat> this is national data about EU migrant workers bringing claims before employment tribunals. Now, the data is not robust for the simple reason that when we first did the exercise back in 2010 to 2012, we had to go through every single paper copy of um, employment tribunal decisions. There are about 150,000 a year. Uh, to try and work out whether they'd been brought by migrant workers. And we use various yardsticks to test that, but we fully admit the data is not robust. But as you can see, there we, we reckon there were about 238 cases brought by EU migrant workers over a period of three years, which would count as 0.071% um, of all cases brought in that period. Now that indicates a significant number of um, a significant under enforcement of employment rights. We repeated the exercise for 2019 to 2022, and this is slightly more reliable uh, because um, uh, the all the decisions are now online, so it didn't require physical manual searching of it, every case. And it looks like the number of cases have gone up slightly, and there's a slightly higher level of enforcement. Now, next slide, please. When you dig into the cases, keep clicking, please. Um, what you see in those cases is actually a remarkable similarity to what we saw on the ground in Great Yarmouth. Refusal of to toilet breaks, people being shouted at, bribery to get better shifts. Next slide, please, and all three that um, there was harassment going on. So um, people were um, uh, allocated by nationality to particular um, fa factory lines. Um, we saw people getting abused in the post-Brexit world, a certain amount of um, race discrimination. And also um, in one case, uh, an employer insisting that workers speak English. Next slide, please, we click twice. And what you see then is um, the, the problem clustering that I referred to before, that people lose their jobs, um, quickly become ho homeless, the very poor quality of the housing that migrant workers are living in, HMO stands for ho Home of Multiple Occupation. Remember the one I showed you, the, the ill-named Buckingham House where um, uh, my research assistant um, lived for a period of time. This is exactly what we saw in Yarmouth. And then, as you can see, problem cust clustering and problem cascading. If you have, if you get sick, you lose your job, you become homeless, um, and then you may be denied benefits because you haven't been in the UK for long enough, and then that affects your health. Now, all of this paints a pretty bleak picture. The only slightly positive um, uh, thing that I can report from these um, employment tribunal cases, and remember they're right across the country, then none of them come from Great Yarmouth, is that for individuals who do manage to get to an employment tribunal, next slide please, actually they're treated extremely well and leniently by the uh, tribunal chair. So they're given longer to apply for, uh, to uh, if, they're, if they're out of time, they're given longer to apply. 
Um, the, there, we've even found cases where the judge had sat down next to the migrant worker with a stapler to try and sort out paperwork and make sure that they had their papers in something of an order. So, in fact, when they got to tribunals, they had a much higher success rate than nationals, um, which tends to suggest that only the most worthy and most determined get to tribunals. Next slide, please. So the question is, if our data is broadly right, that there is very low levels of enforcement <clears throat> before tribunals, even if once they get to tribunals, they are treated well, that raises the question, why are migrant workers not enforcing their rights? Partly it's about culture, um, partly it's about, well, why in my own country, um, I don't want to engage with the state because historically engaging it with the state in Eastern Europe has not been a good um, experience. Partly it's because they don't have the language they certainly don't have the legal advice. Um, it does seem that the longer you're resident in the UK, the more likely you are to bring a case. But as you've seen, the number of cases that have been brought are very small. Now, you might think, well, why does it matter that if they don't enforce their rights? Well, the answer is, I think, um, twofold. One, um, rule of law. Uh, that if there are these rights, they should be enforced and it's important for the dignity and the safety of the individuals. But there's also an economic reason that good employers are um, ensuring that people have their rights protected. And of course, they're being undercut by these, it must be said around Great Yarmouth, predominantly poor employers who are not actually giving people their rights and of course individuals aren't enforcing their rights and you see that very clearly in Great Yarmouth. Next slide please. So um, in our data um, and we looked at nearly 7,000 um, case notes we did not see a single reference to um, employment tribunals. Not a single case was, um, but it was being, um, not a single client was being referred to an employment tribunal. And of those nearly 7,000 case notes, there were only two mentions made to ACAS, the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service. And as one Gyros observer, uh, Riley, advisor Riley observed, in all my years at Gyros, I've only had three people who made complaints to tribunals but a lot who've made complaints to me. People just don't follow through. Which means that, of course, em employers um, get away with it. Next slide, please. But where Gyros does play an important role is in their pragmatic approach to trying to deal with problems. And I've already mentioned some of that to you, but I'll give you a couple of further examples. Uh, in this case, it's a client who didn't get their P45, which marks their, the end of their employment. Um, and as you can see what the Jairus advisor did, I called to the main office to speak to the agency directly. Um, and the administrator informed me that the client is still employed and he still has outstanding holiday play. Client didn't know he was still employed as he hasn't been called for any shifts. Said he will then try to get some work with them. If he not, he will come back if he needs to in order to request P45. So basically it's uh, getting onto the phone to the relevant people and actually trying to sort things out for the client. Next slide, please. Uh, in this case, Jairos actually helps the individual into a new job, writing, helping him write a CV. And in fact, Jairos keeps their CVs on file, um, which is important if they're actually applying for welfare benefits. And as you can see in this case, not only did they help him um, into work, but also to apply for universal credit, which is now the principal welfare benefit. Next slide, please. So what we see coming out of Gyros is that although they're not telling people to fo use formal, <coughs> formal legal routes to enforce their rights, what you see is Gyros adopting a rather pragmatic, resolution-focused approach. And what we also see is that Gyros um, 
play a number of roles. They might be an advocate for their client, not in the way an, a lawyer would be, but to try and make the case to an employer um, that the individual needs holiday pay or a P45. They give them money if they need to get a bus um, to go to a job interview. They act as advisor for the reasons we've seen. They've acted as translator. They also offer one-stop shop support. And it's quite common that individuals come in with a polythene bag full of, of letters, most of which have been unopened. And then Jara slowly um, picks apart all of their problems and tries to help uh, prioritize the things that need to be sorted out um, immediately and those that can wait, and then tries to sort out all that they do. And what's interesting, and this is particularly interesting for lawyers, and particularly someone like me who spent my entire working life talking to students about bringing claims, is that the clients like this much more holistic, pragmatic approach. Next slide, please. You can see here the um, appreciation rates are off the scale. I mean, if, if we as academics got these sorts of um, approval ratings in our questionnaires, we'd be thinking we were doing an absolutely fantastic job. Now, it may be because Jarrah's clients are pragmatic too, and they know that they couldn't afford to go to lawyers. And so this is the best that they can get. But it is striking the level of support support and um, the level of enthusiasm for what Jaros does. Next slide, please. And this is what we call pragmatic law. We call it pragmatic law because it's done by frontline advice organizations against the backcloth of law, albeit with no reference to law or to um, legal routes to enforcement. And the pros are, of course, it's cheap. It's effective in that it often um, resolves problems um, that the clients have got. And as you've seen, the clients like it. There are, of course, serious disadvantages um, that uh, the Jaros um, often misses key legal points. They don't bring cases for harassment, victimization, bullying, uh, racial discrimination. Um, and of course, because they are dealt with on a case by case basis, nothing changes. And so in fact, this is what goes back to my question, what happens when enforcement doesn't happen? Unless Jairos or their equivalents elsewhere in the country get involved, uh, there is zero enforcement. Last slide, please. If this has whetted your appetite, um, this is um, the book which we've been working on for um, years and years trying to pull together our research. And you might recognize the picture on the front cover is indeed of Buckingham House, the picture I showed you. The front cover has been done by one of the Jairos um, uh, workers. And uh, what's incredibly realistic about the drawing is both the bins um, being lined up outside and the fact that the migrant workers are standing outside having a smoke. Thank you very much indeed.